Hello, my name is Sandeep Devabakhani. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Welcome to the Under Pressure, a focus series on hypertension. We will be discussing pathophysiology of hypertension. There are multiple factors that control blood pressure that can be potential contributing components in the development of essential hypertension. These include malfunctions in either humoral or vasodepressor mechanisms. One common humoral mechanism is the RAS, also known as renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Other factors can be abnormal neural mechanisms, defects in peripheral autoregulation, and disturbances in electrolyte and natriuretic hormone balance. Many of these factors are cumulatively um, affected by the multifaceted ROS, which ultimately regulates the arterial blood pressure. It is likely that not one factor is solely responsible for hypertension. Indeed, hypertension is often a complex issue. We will discuss some of these factors in more detail. But before we do that, I did want to ha review how what determines the blood pressure. And this is determined by the cardiac output times the peripheral resistance. If you see an increase in your peripheral resistance, which is often seen by vasoconstriction, this can lead to an increase in the blood pressure. Having an increase in the cardiac output will directly increase your blood pressure. And there are two components that determine your cardiac output, which include your heart rate and your stroke volume. So you have an, if you have an increased heart rate, that can lead to an increase in your cardiac output, which could then lead to an increase in your blood pressure. Conversely, if you see a decrease in your stroke volume, that could lead to a decrease in cardiac output. And this happens a lot in dehydration. And the, this could lead to a decreased blood pressure. So now that you understand what consist, blood pressure consists of, this will help you understand some of the main mechanisms for hypertension. One of the main me uh, pathways that we consider is the raw system. And there are several humoral abnormalities, uh, including the ROS, natriuretic hormone, and hyperinsulinemia that may be involved in hypertension. ROS is probably the one major one because it involves a lot of the regulatory components of arterial blood pressure. This is a figure of the ROS. It is a complex endogenous system. Activation and regulation is primarily controlled by the kidney. This system regulates sodium, potassium, and blood volume. This can then influence vascular tone and sympathetic nervous system activity. So if this system fails, that could then lead to a high blood pressure. So let's walk through this pathway. What is usually triggering this pathway is there's a dehydration or sodium deficiency or a blood loss. This then leads to a decrease in the blood volume which would then, uh, as if you recall from the previous slide, is the decrease in your stroke volume. This can then decrease uh, your blood pressure. And what happens is, uh, this triggers the kidneys to release uh, a hormone called renin. Renin is an enzyme that is stored in the justa glomerular cells, which are located in the afferent arterioles of the kidney. The release of renin is modulated by several factors. It could, there's intrarenal factors and there's external factors. Some examples of intrarenal fa uh, factors include the renal perfusion pressure, the catecholamines, and angiotensin II. And external factors can include sodium, chloride, and potassium. What renin does is uh, actually uh, catalyzes the conversion of angiotensin to angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme. 
and one of our main classes called the ACE inhibitors acts on the, the angiotensin converting enzyme to inhibit that conversion. And so then it does not allow for production of angiotensin 2. So once you have an increase in, in angiotensin 2, this then can lead to a response on the adrenal cortex, which can lead to an increase in aldosterone production. And in the kidneys, uh, this leads to an increased sodium and water reabsorption and increased secretion of potassium and hydro hydrogen ion into the urine. And the ultimate effect of that is there's an increased blood volume. The other potent effect of angiotensin II is that it's a potent, it's a potent vasoconstrictor. And so that's why you see an increase in your blood pressure. So for someone who is uh, ha having dehydration, this can be beneficial to uh, increase your blood pressure. However, in patients with hypertension, this regulation starts to fail. And so then there's a vicious cycle. So what does that mean when it comes to your hemodynamics? So when the raw system is uh, activated, this can lead to an increase in your angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 can increase your peripheral vas resist vascular resistance by causing vasoconstriction. Also, the angiotensin 2 does have a direct impact on your cardiac output. And the reason for this is, uh, if you recall, angiotensin 2 leads to a production of aldosterone, which leads to sodium retention and water reabsorption. And that leads to an increase in your stroke volume, which increases your cardiac output. So angiotensin 2 actually will increase your cardiac output and your peripheral resistance, which both will increase your blood pressure. The other main pathway that needs to be considered is the neural hormonal pathway. And one of the main neural mechanisms is uh, thinking about the sympathetic nervous system. And what happens is there is an increased production of norepinephrine. And this has an effect on both the beta-1 and the alpha-1 receptors. By acting on the beta-1 receptors, it actually stimulates uh, the uh, increase in your heart rate as well as in your contractility. This then leads to an increase in your cardiac output. Norepinephrine also has an effect on the alpha-1 receptors, and this causes a potent vasoconstriction, which then would lead to an increase in your peripheral va vascular resistance. This, again, like angiotensin 2, increases your cardiac output, your peripheral vascular resistance, which would then lead to a blood pressure increase. So there, these are two main mechanisms for why hypertension occurred. Another mechanism that has been discussed is hyperinsulinemia, which means that there is high insulin levels in your bloodstream. And this causes an activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which then stimulates the release of kind of comments such as norepinephrine. And so that causes an increase in metabolic demand. Also, having an increased insulin can affect your renal adaptive mechanisms, which could lead to plasma volume expansion and increased blood flow to the peripheral tissues, even when blood pressure is normal. So local tissue autoregulatory processes that face constrict would then be activated to offset the increased blood flow. So this then increases your peripheral resistance. And if sustained, would also result in thickening of the arterial walls. Because this starts to affect the endothelial pathway, Nitric oxide often uh, is deficient, and that is a potent vasodilator. This could then also contribute to the increased vasoconstriction. So all of these pathways um, can lead to an increase in your blood pressure. So why does this pathway get activated? 
there's a couple of main reasons for why this occurs. Uh, one could be stress. And stress could be either like due to social um, history, whether it's uh, use of illicit drugs uh, or smoking or other factors. It also could be familial, meaning that this is something that is was a, a part of hereditary. Another consideration is a genetic or familial consideration. So this could be either due to the ethnic history or it could be due to the salt sensitivity that could lead to increased sensitivity to the sympathetic nervous system and the ROS. Also, there are factors that lead to vasoconstriction that we discussed before. All of these factors will generally lead to endothelial dysfunction. The vascular endothelium and smooth muscle play important roles in regulating blood vessel tone and blood pressure. It has been postulated that a deficiency in local synthesis of vasodilating substances such as prostacycline or bradycondin or in excess of vasoconstricting substances such as angiotensin 2. And the last component that I want to talk about is uh, thinking about the electrolyte imbalance. So in patients who have hypertension, it has been noted that these patients tend to have excess sodium intake. And there are definitely literature that shows that increased sodium can lead to increased blood pressure. So uh, one of the main modalities is to recommend patients to decrease their sodium intake, which has been associated with the decrease in their blood pressure and has led to car reduction in cardiovascular events. Another possible po mechanism for why hypertension might occur may be due to a lack of calcium and potassium, which could then affect your smooth muscle tone and then lead, alter the vascular resistance. However, there is no data yet that this, by altering, by repleting your calcium or potassium, that this could reduce your cardiovascular risk. At this time, we just know that they're associated, having a deficiency in calcium or potassium can lead to a, um, can lead to hypertension. However, we don't know how to address that. This concludes uh, our the discussion of uh, the pathophysiology of hypertension. To learn more about the different other aspects of hypertension, please visit our YouTube channel for more videos. Thank you.